Welcome to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where we feature top leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry with your host, Drew Hendricks. Now, let's get started with the show. Drew Hendricks here. I'm the host of the Legends Behind the Craft podcast, where I talk with leaders in the wine and craft beverage industry, from marketing agencies that help wineries sell directly to consumers, to today's guest, Paul Salcedo, CEO of Bottle Man, whose company's mission is to bring a wine story to life through technology. Past guests of Legends Behind the Craft include Lori Mayotte of Outshinery, Ashley Dubois Leonard from Innovent, and Andrew Means of Transom. If you haven't listened to these yet, be sure to check them out and, su- and subscribe. Today's episode is sponsored by Barrels Ahead. At Barrels Ahead, we work with you to implement a one of a kind content strategy, one that highlights your authenticity, tells your story, and makes your business stand out from your competitors. Paul, in short, at Barrels Ahead, we unlock your brand's story to unleash your revenue. Go to barrelsahead.com today to learn more. Now, before I introduce today's guest, I want to give a big thank you to Marty McDonald author of Great Beer is Not Enough, and co-founder of Bad Rhino Inc. On our last show, Marty and I talked about the ways craft brewers can use digital marketing to scale their business. I am super excited to talk with today's guest, Paul Salcedo, co-founder and CEO of Bottle Band. Paul's a Napa Valley native who not only has a vast knowledge of the wine industry, but also extensive roots in the Silicon Valley tech industry. He brings more than 24 years of operations, engineer, engineering, and software development experience to Bottle Van, along with a passion for food, wine, and spirits. Welcome to the show, Paul. Hey, thanks for having me, Drew. Oh, thanks for being on. So, Paul, t- tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, like, you kind of summarized it at the start, but I've been uh, working in the Silicon Valley since 1997. Uh, work started with a small company called Sony Electronics. <laughs> so it's like I uh, was uh, what we call back then an application engineer. I, I, did, I supported uh, embedded software into these hardcore, these high end tape backup drives. Mm. But in uh, like 99, I did my first startup with a company called Liquid Audio, which was an audio streaming service, uh, kind of the forefront uh, where I kind of app iTunes is the, the, these days. Um, but you know, it's been doing startups, multiple startups since then until 2018, when I was fortunate enough to get some funding to start bottle then. And so, um, that's kind of where my journey is right now. But prior to that, uh, I grew up in Napa Valley, uh, moved there in 1976 when I was seven years old, I believe it was, oh, uh, literally grew, uh, left there in 97, but you know, that whole time frame introduction to, you know, my next door neighbor was a winemaker, uh, you know, worked in the restaurant industry, worked there for about four and a half years in the wine and, and, and food, worked at, you know, a couple of really nice restaurants, like one is Sholey at Miramontes, which is no longer around, but um, that local restaurant called Bosco's and um, worked at Roberto du Soleil as a, you know, the pool bartender at the time. So, you know, a lot of food um, and love for food and wine. And so I knew uh, getting in. I'm a tech guy by by nature. That's just my passion, and that's why I moved out here. But um, you know, I knew at one point in time the food and wine and the tech would come together, and uh, that's kind of where Bottlevin is at this point. So amazing! What what was Napa Valley like back in the '80s? It was very much farm country. <laughs> so you know, I have a ten year old that you know I'm raising, and uh, you know, I think of all the stuff. You know, I, I recall going. You know, there there's like creeks, there's paths, there's dirt. You know, me. My friends that we grew up with were riding, you know, our BMX bikes. You know, we you know, were fourth and fifth grade. You know, literally, you know, we talked about, you know, you know, you know, they call them latchkey kids, right? Because mm-hmm. your parents were working, and so um, we'd go back to our houses, play football in the front yard. Um, again, you know, you were surrounded with wine and grape and there's vineyards, so you you just knew about the whole wine industry in itself. And you know, my neighbor. Um, he's kind of like my second father, you know, at one point in time, he uh, was the head winemaker for Franciscan winery, uh, a gentleman named Ken Robinson. And he, you know, he used to take me when I was of age. Well, even prior to age, he would let me smell the wine. But then when I, would, I turned 21, you know, he would let me, he'd bring me into the barrel rooms and we'd take, you know, samples of tasting and all that stuff. And so 
you know, the, the whole wine piece is just, it's just a part of me. And um, I think it's what I find funny selling tech into the wine industry is that um, typically the wine industry does, there's only a few really tech people that actually are educated with wine. And I think that kind of helps because you can, when they talk about a cab or a Zen or about harvest or, you know, because harvest just goes, everyone goes dark. Um, you can relate with that, that even bottling. I have, you know, Balboa Winery, a couple of times we've helped them bottle um, on the bottling line. And uh, part of the technology with even Steve Reynolds, we were part of that piece to help develop and see how that worked on the bottling line. So, um, you know, again, it's it's growing up in Napa was, I feel, a privilege. When you were that young, though, you get the small town disease. So you mm-hmm. want to go get out of the small country. So I actually went to boarding school in, in, in uh on, not because I was bad, but because I wanted to go to boarding school and it was by the beach, uh, the boarding school I went to. And so, you know, it's, uh, again, it's, it's, you don't realize it. I think in college is when I realized like how special Napa Valley was. So, uh, it, it, it's, I, you know, I couldn't have asked to grow up in a better area. So. Well, that's amazing. What did, what did your neighbor teach you? What was the big takeaway that you kind of reflect back upon? You know, he it just, just kind of the, you know, my neighbor was just, he's one of the, you know, I think there's uh, his talent. Like I said, he, at one point he was at winemaker for, for Franciscan, but uh, he was so passionate about what he does and, and some of the stuff that he wouldn't give in. I mean, there's, there's some things as a normal business person where you have to kind of network and kind of suck it up sometimes you could say. Um, and he wasn't willing to give some of those. So some opportunities I think he could have been with would have been, you know, I think he could have a great, not, I think, I know he was a great winemaker. So one of my favorite wines is an 83 Faye Cab from the Faye Vineyard that he had produced himself. Um, but what I learned from him was literally just the appreciation of food and wine. Um, I used to go over there and it was, you know, literally, um, you know, just homemade meals, uh, wines, and I mean, just incredible homemade meals. Like, you know, one of my favorite dishes was a beef stroganoff. And then uh, one other time he made, he, he wasn't the first people, you, you can think of innovation wise, but he was doing uh, wood-fired, pizza, uh, uh, wood-fired uh, pizzas on his barbecue and his hibachi. Um, and so you kind of, I, we, we recall one time when he was remodeling a house and he'd use some of the wood from the house to burn. And we actually had the pizza and it tasted like some type of, you know, tarnish or something. And we're like, Oh my gosh, this doesn't taste good. But you know, the pizza well, that might be a lesson right there. Yeah, don't so don't cook with reuse, the walls of your house. <laughs> don't reuse wood for cooking or for barbecuing. But, um, you know, he he made one of the first barbecue pe- uh, chicken pizzas I've ever had. You know, CPK has kind of made that that famous right now. But, uh, you know, he one of the things that I learned from him from a wine perspective, you know, as I was growing up, he would literally go, you know, take a look at the color, swirl it, smell it. Um, I know when his when his nose and his palate was at their prime, he could literally tell you, you know, if he's had it before, you know, what vineyard, what vintage, what, you know, what, what, you know, what region um you know his his nose and his palate was that good and his wife Vivian was exactly the same way and um you know my I'm a Filipino you know my background my parents are Filipino and um they you know it was for them their first generation and not for I'm first generation they moved from the Philippines and so when uh you know it comes to mathematics or homework and stuff like that you know my next door neighbors helped me through a lot of my homework and, and and education growing up and so I was blessed to be able to go over there, but then, you know, I also got educated in food and wine. So it's, it's just one of those things. And, you know, to this date, I, I visit them, you know, COVID has been a little tough because they're, they're elderly as well right now. Uh, I believe Ken is uh, it's like 60 in his, his mid sixties at this point. Mm. Um, but they have a daughter, her name's Amelia. That's uh, I believe she's 28. I I'm bad with ages right now. But talk about someone that is a foodie and knows her end palate. She's got, gotten all that from both of her parents. And so I believe I got some of that too, but I'm, you know, I'm getting, getting past that prime where my nose isn't as good as it was back in the day. So, mm-hmm. um, but again, they, you know, learned a lot from Ken. So. so it sounds like a lot of the stuff you learned might be culminating right now in bottle van. Yes, with, definitely. With your technology. The, Tell us a little the, bit about this new venture you've got going on. Yeah. So bottle van started, uh, we, uh, 
we had so I had actually took a little bit of a stab in two thousand eight and nine with a a I come so part of my background is is customization or they call it print on demand. Um, I ran operations for uh, in, uh, for the software development uh, at a, in manufacturing for a company called Zazzle, mm. and and what they did was essentially they did you know print on demand shirts, hats, uh, and you name it, they did it. If you go to Zazzle, you'll see you'll see they do a bunch of stuff. And I did that for close to eight years. And so uh, after that piece, I did, I, I got, we bootstrapped a company called Blending Table. And Blending Table was almost a Shopify for wineries where you could do custom labels. And we had three, uh, we had two main wineries that we worked with at the time. One was Bargetto Winery up in Santa Cruz. And then we did another one with uh, the Wine Foundry, which is a custom press facility in Napa where we would do custom labels for them. And it was using a technology where you could design the label online uh, through a store. Um, we also did, we did partner, had a few uh, partners. They were for their, their special runs with Silverado Vineyards, um, where we did like a Christmas label for them and stuff like that. So it was custom labels. And, and, and you know, it, it, it's, it's one of the things. So one thing I've learned with technology is, is timing. And, and the timing wasn't quite there yet for that, that technology. And so uh, Bottlevin, as what I did with different, so going into the Bottlevin is um, I did a little bit of research. And in 2018, uh, Apple had opened up the market for third-party developers to, uh, to now use the NFC chip reader inside of their iPhones. And for people that don't know what that is, uh, essentially, if you use Apple Pay or Google Pay and you tap your phone on the register, uh, typically grocery stores, I'm seeing them on gas pumps now all over the place. Uh, a great one is uh, NFC chips for Tesla. That's how you open their cards. But NFC is built into all iPhones and uh, Android. So iPhone 6 Plus and up. And then uh, Google's had it in their phone since 2008. So they... This is kind of the second iteration, kind of with QR codes happening mm -hmm. right now as well. But this is the second iteration of NFC. Uh, I believe NFC didn't make it the first time around because Apple wasn't supportive of it. Apple wanted to do their own thing. So back to my investigation, I did some R&D. I talked to wineries. Uh, I have a friend that used to manage Sterling Vineyards in the tasting room. Went back to a friend of mine uh, that, that actually ran the wine boundary. Um, I have another, uh, the, the president, uh, Loretta Bargetto of Bargetto Winery, and I had created a, a, a proof of concept mobile app based on the idea of what I was going to do with Bottlevin. And all the, all the people I talked to in the industry was fascinated about telling the story when I tapped the bottle of wine. And now here comes, you know, this app launches where you can now say, here's everything about the winery, show pictures, show videos. Mm -hmm. And, and all those and everything about that wine, right? Because you can only fit so much on a back label. And so the journey started uh, when, our, uh, when uh, one of our investors, Tok Luong, said, you know, I was, he was a mentor of mine on how to raise investment because I knew mm -hmm. that uh, I really wanted to take this company, uh, you know, big. And so being in the Silicon Valley, you hear those stories all the time. And so I was just getting guidance from, from Tok on, how do I do this stuff, right? How, like, what is, what is the, you know, I had to build a, a deck. I had to build financials. I had to do all these pieces. And when I got the positive feedback from the wineries, he's like, I want in. And so that's what launched Bottlevin. And what Bottlevin started off with was um, we were very fortunate. We, uh, off the bat within the first year, we had three wineries that went to be our pilot wineries. Amazing. And so uh, the first one that you know we we ran with, and we did a press release back in 2009 on this. But the first uh, run we did was with Re Reynolds Family Winery and Steve Reynolds. Uh, Steve Reynolds says you know has become such a really close friend, but I also feel like a, a a family in that winery. Like I can go to the winery and just feel comfortable there, and and that's what they bring to their winery. It's it's a family owned winery. But Steve, it, he has visions. He has, you know, he's, he's, he's a guy that's an early adopter and understands things. And when we came to Steve with, uh, so I met Steve through another friend. Uh, uh, his name's Neville Boston. Uh, if you go look at the first digital license plate in California, he is the uh, founder and inventor of that. Um, I believe they're in Washington now and in Texas. 
Neville is a, 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 a high school friend of mine, um, incredible individual on, on, I mean, if you think about it, he, he, he made a digital license plate for California. So um, Neville introduced me to Steve Reynolds. And when I talked to Steve about what he's like, hey, yeah, I definitely want to know what you know, about this. So when we got funding and I talked, you know, I talked to Steve, Steve's like, I want it on my next line. So we literally in 2000, the uh, end of 2018, oh, 2019, uh, bottling of 2019, um, we did our first run of NFC labels uh, with the Reynolds Family Winery uh, line for that year. And so to date, we have um, over 200,000 bottles with NFC chips on them. Uh, we have, so we've expanded quite a bit uh, and I can go more into this later, but we now support not only NFC, we also support QR codes. We, uh, we support um, UPC codes and we also support uh, label recognition, meaning you can, it's, uh, if you're familiar with Avino and they do label recognition by taking the picture, we support that now in our platform. And so the whole, the whole thing behind Bottlevin is um, we're a mobile first technology, meaning uh, we concentrate and focus on, on engaging with your customer uh, through a mobile uh, platform and through you know, any type of scan. So it's not just a label scan, um, some stuff we've done is like shelf talkers. We've done um, promotional codes where we send inserts into the wine clubs and there'll be promotions on there that they can scan a QR code and then it'll unlock that inside the bottle of an app. So there's a bunch of just digital uh, ways to engage your brand with the bottle of an platform. Uh, we've made it very easy on that side to, to also manage that. We have a web portal where all the any winery partner goes in and they can literally manage, uh, they, can, they can put a wine into the system and it probably takes them maybe five or 10 minutes and then it's live. So all our content and everything about this stuff you see in the, in the mobile apps are, are real time updatable. So um, part of the, part of this, part of the uh, you know, evergreen movement is part of, you know, if I get a new video or I get a new accolade or I get a new recipes, like uh, one thing we added uh, along the journey is we added support for distilleries and spirits. Mm. And so one of the really cool ones, uh, one of the uh, distillers we partnered with is Humboldt Distillery and talk, they have some incredible recipes with, with, with their, with all their spirits. Uh, and it's just, you know, when you see that inside the app that you, when you scan a bottle of, you do a label scan or through the UPC with the Humboldt uh, spirits, and all of a sudden you have all these recipes that are accessible that they've produced on their, you know, through their website or through, through the bottle of in platform, then um, it, it's that engaging piece, you know, the, so back it up a little bit. So Steve, Steve was our first producer to do NFC labels. Uh, Bricolor Vineyards was our second. Uh, they were the first to actually um, hop on board with us, but they hadn't produced that. That was their first year of producing wine. Mm. So their whole lineup went into and, and Bricolor, that story in itself. So Drew, you may want to uh, interview Mark. He's the uh, he's, uh, owner and proprietor of, of Bricolor Vineyards. Mark, uh, I'm writing it down. Yeah, and I'll, I'll send an intro to you, but oh, Mark, awesome. uh, he's, Mark and his daughter, Sarah, um, they, they started this incredible venue. Uh, this, the story is incredible because it started off as an event, event venue to where it's a winery now, but they also opened their test tasting room during COVID. Mm. So think about just that. I mean, you're ready to open your toast tasting room and you and I had some, had some conversations, but you're going to, you know, you're going to open your tasting room and now you're hit with COVID and all the, you know, all the rules and regulations and shelter in place and all that stuff. But um, Mark was, you know, he was our, uh, our, our really our first person to actually do, a, you know, become our first pilot winery. But we you know, bottled with all their labels with NFC chips. And then um, the third. What, ty what type of information did they put in that? So once you look in the, you click your NFC chip, your phone to the NFC chip and something comes up. What, what, what information did they choose to put in that first pilot release? That, so, that so what's part. happened with the, so what it, what it is, is you literally, when you go into there, you can put in everything about that wine. So the vineyard, the terroir, the vintage notes, the, um, you know, tasting notes, uh, drinking window, um, videos, uh, 
yeah, lifestyle images of bottle shots and 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 people, you know, part of Belvin too is that you can actually add notes and photos to those bottles of wine that you actually scan. So when you scan a bottle of wine from Brickler or from Reynolds Family Winery or from Balboa, what happens is it launches that wine. It shows the vintage. It shows the name of the wine. It gives you know you know a, a, a summary of what that wine is typically the tasting notes, and then it gives you any of the cool geeky stuff that you may want. The, uh, the, very, first, uh, when, the very first iteration of our mobile app was at Steve Reynolds, uh, his, uh, his Steadfast Wine Club. It's an incredible bottle of wine that's got a big metal um, you know, label on it. And uh, we went to one of his release parties for that. And it was literally, the app was made for the Steadfast Wine. And, um, you know, we did we did we did a, a video on how Steadfast became Steadfast. We did a bunch of imagery. We, uh, again, had all the uh, information on, you know, the the grapes, the vintage, um, the blends. Uh, and it was funny because I remember some uh, some of his wine club members were like, hey, no, this is not what I heard. I heard it was this. Right. And, uh, you know, I had gotten all the data sheet info from Steve, you know, you know, a couple of weeks before that to put into the to the app. And, and, you know, it's funny hearing these, you know, well, I had no idea. I thought it was this blend and this type of a blend. <laughs> so um, it was, you know, it was a really cool thing. And my co-founder, Jason Driver, he is the other. So give you a little bit. Bottlevin is not just me. Uh, Bottlevin is also Jason Driver. He is uh, a restaurateur up in Boise, Idaho. Um, but talk about we, we both met in Napa Valley. And so a lot of, you know, what. Bottlevin is to this date is is that combination of, of Jason and I working together on on what we feel and, and talking to people in, in the industry. But um, again, we are, you know, our, our, our launch was with making smart bottles. But to this point, we're actually using just scanning technology to essentially give um, that mobile experience. If you look at um, if you look at what's happening in normal retail right now. Right. Um, Amazon is a great one. Right. You. Um, Everyone in retail looks at the mobile experience because when you get an email, when you get um, when you get some type of ad or, or you're on Facebook or whatever, typically you're on your phone. Right. So so, uh, you know, we, we focus on that. We also focus on being able to allow wineries and distilleries to do that in an affordable fashion because um, building a mobile app is not cheap. And mm -hmm. so. <laughs> and, sc and scanning is actually finally came into the mainstream. We've been working with QR codes for probably a decade and it was, it was a slow adoption in the U S versus some of the other countries. But once COVID hit and all the restaurant menus turned into scan the QR code on the table, I think everyone gave it a boost. Now, now it's just very intuitive to use. And you guys are now, is, that's one of the main ways that I see yes. you guys using it on the back of a bottle. A hundred percent. So our uh, this past year with all our pilot wineries um, have um, they've all converted to QR code. And, uh, you know, the, so I love you asking about QR code, because prior to the pandemic, um, there was this. Um, you could say a bad taste in the mouth with the QR code. Uh, and, and, and I had to explain that to many wineries because I don't think they understood why QR code wasn't successful. QR code, the reason why it wasn't successful was uh, one back in, when it launched, um, not everyone had a smartphone, right? So, you know, some people were still on their flip phones, right? So you didn't have that opportunity to scan a QR code. Uh, two was not everyone had broadband on their phones, right? So you, if you had broadband, it was, you know, it was, it was really slow. Back then, I think it was 3G or whatever it was, right? And so that experience in itself was not as great. Um, and the third big one for me was, is in, this is one of the biggest failures, I think, is that you had to go find a mobile app to go, to go scan a QR code. And yeah, like, I think I use laser, laser something or other. Well, and they still have people doing that, but I don't know if you know this, but uh, it's an education thing. I, I've learned to kind of educate on the technology that we built in Bottleman. And um, at, as of... Uh, as of now, you can literally on iPhone and on an Android, just open the native camera and it will read a QR code. You don't need software. You don't need anything. You literally just use the phone camera 
and it'll go and launch, you know, if, if you have an app that works with that, it like in our scenario, if you scan a bottle of QR code, it'll autom and you have the app on your phone, it'll automatically open up the app and whatever that experience is going to be. Um, if you, if you don't have a mobile app, it will take you to wherever, usually a website of some sort, and you're hoping that's mobile responsive. But, um, you know, I had this discussion with a, a, an individual that's looking to sell, help us sell bottle then, uh, just yesterday. And, and one of the conversations for him was kind of like, um, well, you know, what's the difference between your QR code and, and me making a QR, QR code. And I said, the difference is that our, our QR codes are smart and they're dynamic. And uh, I'm not saying we're the only ones that are doing this from a platform perspective. There's a lot of QR code generators out on the internet and services, but what these QR code services do and what we do is be able to track data behind that. So you can create a QR code that says www.drew.com, mm -hmm. right? But all it's doing is taking me to the website. But, you know, but if you're doing it in, in a technology way where you want to learn about your QR codes and the engagement with the people you're dealing with, um, and, and there's, there's a bunch of levels of privacy, um, and that's all opt-in for the user when they use you, you see these prompts, hey, can you, you know, can we get your location? Can we do all this stuff, right? Again, the privacy is there, especially with Apple. They've done a lot of recent, you know, locking down the notifications and the locations where as a developer, you have to make sure you're you're complying with those development pieces. But um, you know, back to what I was saying on the QR code, you you want a you know industry wide. I don't care who you're doing it with. You want to use some type of QR code generated platform that gives you data behind that. And um, the reason you want to do that are a couple of reasons why. If I just do the Drew.com static, I can never ever like change that on the bottle. If I do it in a dynamic form where there's an ID, so we, we deal, we, we do IDs and a bunch. So when you see these big URLs with all these question marks, this, this, this ID and all that stuff, um, the, the more normal, the normal term for them are called UTM. And I forgot what they're called UTM links. I forgot what UTM universe, I, again, I forgot what UTM stands for, but um, it, it, what it does, it lets you know what the campaigns are. It lets you ID what that scan was. And so in our world, in Bottlevin, you know, if you use our platform um, and you allow certain things, we, uh, you know, there's a one thing. I'm getting kind of geeky technical here, so stop me if you want me to stop. Oh, it's fascinating. <laughs> but, um, it's a uh, well. So think of like um, a house address, right? There's one, two, three, four, whatever rose rose lane. There's five, six, eight, whatever. Those are all the numbers for the house addresses and streets. Um, in the in the in the internet world, there those things are called IP addresses. So every, every phone, every PC, anyone that's on the internet is connected with some type of an IP address. And so the IP address has basic information. So um, like, you know, if this IP address, you know, it, it, it's served up by Verizon or AT&T or whoever, and it's coming from some type of data center. And so you can, when you get these IP addresses, you can find out like, you know, to way to measure like a campaign on a QR code with let's say a bottle of wine, you, you can start looking at how many different IP addresses are actually being scanned on this. And you know that uh, if that QR code is being scanned with the 1990 uh, Reynolds Chardonnay, then I know that that bottle of wine has been scanned from this IP address, which could, which typically the IP address is associated with the city. So we know that it's in LA, it's in Seattle, or it's in this, right? So mm -hmm. what I'm, you know, what I've, what I've kind of gone off path a little bit about is that that's what a smart QR code does for you. It so, allows the wineries to better track where their wines are being drunk and consumed and where interest is, where, where they should target maybe more, more marketing dollars towards. Exactly. Well, and also is, is, is anyone even looking at your wine, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's, it, are people looking at the engagement piece? What I've learned with QR code uh, in the pandemic and, and just go, I mean, you may not look at this now, but I think anyone listening to the podcast, they will kind of open it up on this. Go into a grocery store right now and pick up any piece of any, any like cookies, bread, um, milk, and you will see a QR code on it. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible just in a year how 
QR codes have kind of taken over the, the society and in retail. Like you said, in restaurants, people are offering QR codes to read the rest of the menu, mm-hmm. right? So I went into Alexander's, which is a high-end steakhouse out here in the Silicon Valley. And the first thing I went into when I checked in was, you know, would you like sir, a paper menu or would you like just a QR code to check out your menu? Right. And so, um, you know, besides that, think about, you know, QR codes. I, I've been in the Home Depot and Lowe's because I'm one of these hobbyists that like fixing up my house. And literally there's training, there's banners with training video QRs. Yeah, it's it's amazing make- how main, it, I, if you ask, I, I think we talked at the direct consumer wine symposium and we were talking about bottle van a year ago, right before the pandemic. And we, we had a conversation about QR codes and it, it's changed night and day. And I never, never, never would have experienced if you asked me a year ago, I wouldn't have guessed it, but it makes it complete sense that it's now mainstream, it, which well, has and, done a lot. The pandemic's done a lot to help educate the consumers. How's how how are how are your wineries educating the consumers, knowing to show them what what's behind this QR code, what they're going to see? I should have prepped you on on uh, on what you, I should have been able to share some uh, photos with you, and I can send them to you afterwards if you want to send, send them. Out. We'll put them in the show notes. Yeah. So what's cool is so Brickler up in Windsor, California. They're they are they are totally using bottle vent in in like they're our our biggest supporter. Of, of using the technology. Part of it's because Mark comes from tech. Mark mm. is um, an enterprise tech person. And so, um, you know, when we told him what we did, he was just like, this is a no brainer for us, right? And so um, it, it, I was just at the winery uh, three weeks ago with my family because um, they just opened up, you know, outside tasting again. And, uh, you know, me and my family have been sheltered the whole time and we haven't had a trip and we haven't done anything. So as my family and another close family that we usually do uh, summer trips with. And, and we went to Brickler, we went to Reynolds and we went to another one called Anarchist, which we've been talking to, uh, but the, they're owned by the Wine Foundry. And so at Brickler, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. You walk in and the first thing you see is a QR code. Mm-hmm at the check-in station. And what that QR code does for them, and I help them integrate this, is that that QR code is a COVID consent form. So they take their phone, they scan the QR code, it now redirects them to an online consent form. So I help them build this because again, we were using the bottle of technology to do this stuff. So that, that code gets scanned, it redirects to a online page with the online form. One of our, you know, you, you, Mary, you, you mentioned Lori of Outshinery. The other person that I love to death and, and, and love this company is Commerce 7. Oh, yes. Um, Zach has been one of the best supporters. Uh, his dad, Andrew, as well. You know, industry, just, just a guy that knows everything about tech and wine. But Zach and I met when they first started. We kind of all came up in the same time frame, you could say, a little bit. And um, we did an early version of a ACE product syncing tool, meaning... Um, you can put in your Commerce 7 credentials and all the water, bottles of wines will get synced into the bottle bin platform. And so um, back to Bricolor. So what's nice about that is that online form is managed through the Commerce 7 platform. Hmm. So it was this kind of, uh, if you are, so one of the things I love about Commerce 7 is that if you're a, being a tech guy, if you're not, if you're not doing kind of, APIs and sharing like ways to, to, to build your platform out, then, you know, it, you're not doing it. You know, that, that, that's the old school way of, of software development. Software mm-hmm. development was I would bring my database. I'd bring all of my stuff. I do it all, all my, I'd, my user management, all those pieces I would build in house. Nowadays, there's so many services that you can tap into like an account management tool or like, um, you know, uh, like commerce seven, I can, build into other API with all the content, all the information. So we can grab all that data and also sync it with our Bottleven platform. So awesome. um, Commerce 7 was really kind of, for me, when I looked at POSs, um, a, just an innovator. Um, and, and, and they have, they're, they're, going, they're going crazy right now. Um, and, 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 and mad props to them because they have, for me, when I have a winery ask me, that's kind of the one, that's the one POS platform I recommend. Um, oh, absolutely. I'm a huge so, fan of that. And also yeah. the fact that they're a little more nimble and they don't try to do everything from, exactly. a des- from a design standpoint, you can actually use your own like web framework and put the commerce seven on it and they don't, 
they're not trying to be the one 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 stop shop marketing platform as well exactly and so I, again i went off path but uh you know so well, i hope to have commerce seven on the show i've been i've been trying to get a hold of zach oh uh, well i can try to ping him for you he's usually pretty <laughs> responsive for me so let me let me talk see if, you can, if i can get a hold of him absolutely um, but you know back to bricola is um you know they have that so when you get into the winery every tasting table has a qr code on it mm. so all the qr codes go to their online menu right and all their tastings and all their pairings right every one of their bottles have either an nfc or a qr code on it and so their wine you know their wine club members their you know the people that are looking at the wine can engage with that and so um it, what's been nice with brickler is that you uh isabella is one of the people over there that i work with that's you know doing their marketing and sarah uh they're both in charge of marketing they are very incredible with always engaging with me when they have a new wine coming out or they have a new thing they want like they just recently engaged with me on uh an event they're going to and they're like, hey paul can you help us generate a qr code for this tasting event that we're having with this individual and so um you know what that's what bottle vin's about bottle vin's about literally how can we help the wineries and the distilleries be able to engage with that customer and and let them know about that stuff and uh as this technology has been in retail i'd say for the last three to five years um it was it was you know i will be very open and honest um the last two years have been pretty hard for me to to get wineries to understand and distilleries why this makes sense for them and i will tell you why because if you look at their normal distribution uh, it was through groceries. It was through mm -hmm. restaurants. It was through normal, you know, on-premise type of, of of sales. So the pandemic, you know, the, the wineries and wine clubs, which is one of the partners we're dealing with, we have a, a wine club that we're doing a mobile app for. Mm -hmm. um, that's all run off the bottle in platform. Um, the ones that were already doing this pre-pandemic have grown exponentially. And in 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 their customer base, not um, you, know, you know, this is no secret because I know they talk about it. But you know, Commerce Seven I think went from a hundred customers to five hundred. I think those are latest. That's amazing. Right? And 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 everything I've watched, I've been keeping up with the industry. You know, I look at everyone that had you know and their DTC online uh, sales have gone went led to the three to four hundred percent increase during the pandemic, and so. Prior to that, this what Bottle of Inn had built, you you had to find the early adopter, the guy like a Steve Reynolds, the guy like a Mark that understood, even Tom Glaze of Balboa. They just said, this makes so much sense for us and we're gonna do this on our whole line, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I talked to you prior to the show, in the last month, it's been amazing on the amount of, of, of opportunity that has come my way and talking to wineries, we have you know a few proposals out there right now with some incredible, incredible campaigns. Um, you know, one is based off authenticity on an allocated wine, um, and the other one is kind of an on-premise wine tour feature that mm. you know works with Bottlevin. And so, um, it, the pandemic was good for for having the industry in itself uh, understand what uh, understand what you know tech can do for them. I think one of uh, the SVB report that's every year at the start of every year that they have mm -hmm. on, on the, in, you know, the state of the industry, um, I believe Paul Mabre in that well, one of the things I really respect that he said, he's like, guys, you got to understand that this is the year, this is now the start of kind of the golden age of tech in the wine industry. It, it's kind of like, I, I, I personally believe from a, from a technology point in the wine industry right now, that it's, it's going to, there are going to be wineries that don't adopt technology and i, I it's you're going to kind of see something i hate to say this but it's just what's happening with technology kind of what what's gone through with the retail industry with brick and mortars and 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 amazon and 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 target and all that so the the retail industry and brick and mortars that pivoted and started using technology to sell um even during the pandemic we think about restaurants that are doing curbside pickup or doing takeout um you know innovating I did a little experiment on doing uh, ready meals where you could warm up a, a food. It was just, 
I love cooking. Again, I'm a foodie. Uh -huh. And so I wanted pasta fresh. And it was uh, my founder, uh, my other co-founder, Jason, we kind of came up with this idea of, hey, how can we make fresh pasta that it seems like it came off the grill, but also be able to preserve it in the fridge, right? And so we kind of created these ready meal things. But, you know, in talking with him, right, you, you look at, you know, there's these things called ghost kitchens now. So when you order food through DoorDash or through Uber or whatever it is, it may not be even a restaurant, a physical brick and mortar. Hmm. It, it literally could be a commercial kitchen. And, and, and it's just the DoorDash guys are going to pick it. They're, they're called ghost kitchens if you're not familiar with them. Yeah, but um, and, and a lot of these ghost kitchens are running multiple restaurants out of their kitchen. So it's a commercial kitchen. I, they're producing an Italian restaurant, a Mexican restaurant, a, um, a Thai restaurant. And it's all coming out of the same kitchen. And the DoorDash, the DoorDash, the, the Postmates and the Uber Eats guys are all just going to this commercial kitchen, picking up the food and delivering it to the consumer. So as a consumer, you don't really know that. And I will say the number one ghost kitchen that I'm aware of. And I don't know how much you know about the influence community, but there is an influencer in the, in, in the community that's called Mr. Beast. And uh, mm -hmm. I know about him because my son is a 10 year old and this guy came up. He's a gaming influencer, how he started, but he's just made he gives back to the community. I mean, he gives away houses and cards. It's pretty incredible. His um, his community is 50 million YouTube users. Yeah, it, it's pretty crazy. I mean, think about 50 million people that are subscribed to your YouTube channel, right? And this guy did his ghost kitchen for making burgers. They call it Mr. Beast Burgers. Obviously, my son was like, Dad, I want a Mr. Beast Burger. I'm like, okay, sure. Let's go see what this is about. And, and I, there's no address. There's no nothing on there. It gives you kind of a location, but you don't know where they're coming from. But you can only order it on Uber. I mean, on Uber Eats, right? Uh, or DoorDash. And I'm like, okay, well, let's order it. I get there, meal comes within an hour, all the burgers, the fries, and all that stuff. Uh, I found out how that's run. Literally, what they're doing is um, uh, Mr. Beast works with a company that works with restaurants around the country that says, hey, if you want supplemental income because your kitchen's not running 100% during the pandemic, if you make burgers for this, for this, you know, Mr. Beast burgers, then we give you a percentage of that for each one you're made. So these burgers are typically being made out of another restaurant's kitchen. And so, um, you know, that's another big thing that we could go into. It's not really, I mean, it's something that Bottleman is always looking at, but I actually see um, the influencer community and, and what's going on in that world and, and how tech is starting to, you know, with these ghost kitchens and, and you know, there's so much stuff that the pandemic has come out. Me and you right now talking about Zoom. Yeah. A year and a half ago, you know, did you even have Zoom? Right. I did because I was a tech guy, but now everyone in the wine industry I talk about knows how to use Zoom. Yeah, right? that was that was a huge learning curve for a few people right at the start. Yeah. And so and, and again, that's that's kind of what's kind of changed, you know, mm -hmm. during the pandemic. There's just so the, you know, back to what I, I was getting at was the industry itself, you know, is changing the wine industry and the ones that have already gone into the, so you, as a winery, I believe in, in you being a marketer and no one understands, I believe that you, um, they need to start looking at, you know, digital marketing, like through Facebook, through Instagram, through, Absolutely. you know, the big one right now is TikTok. you know, is it right for the wine industry? I've heard plus and minuses on that. Um, I've done a couple of TikToks to make a fool of myself just to, <laughs> I wanted to see what the traction was. And it's, it's funny because you know, back when I was young, I used to dance and I made a couple old man dancing videos, but um, I wanted to see how those went. And I got about 150 views, which isn't shabby. But then I started making, so that ready meal thing I was talking about, I started making videos on how I made the pasta mm -hmm. and I'm getting 600 plus views on TikTok with that. Right. And so my friends laugh at me more because I'm making these videos, but I'm actually doing data analytics and, and that's what it's about. It's kind of like when I put something out there in digital media, like if you're not learning from that and you're not taking advantage of it, then there's no reason to do it. Um, and that's what I tell every winery with Bottlevin. It's like Bottlevin is a tool for you to, to engage and promote with your tribe or your consumers that buy your wine or your spirits. But unless you actively use it, it's not just going to work for you. I've had conversations where with winery owners that are like, 
yeah, I put an ad up on on Facebook and I didn't get anything out of it. So it's not really working for me. <laughs> we well, hear that often. You got to yeah. gotta use the technology correctly. And that the, the technology today, I think a lot of the things Paul was right. Paul Mayberry was right on the money when he said technology is becoming vital and it's becoming now seen as a way to actually enhance the story. Like what you're doing with bottle van. The yeah. winery, it's, it's not, it's no longer opposed to the story. It's actually one of those tools. And if you're not using it, you're not, you're not fully being able to express your story. Through all yeah, and, the that, and that's it. Because the whole thing for me is that, I mean, back to the influencers and, and digital marketing and ads, Google ads, Facebook ads, Instagram ads, right? Um, the wineries that invested in that, because I, I, am, I will tell you that, you know, focusing in digital marketing is not cheap. It's you, you, you can have your tasting room guy do it um, and, and maybe he'll do it every now and then, but that's not getting you anywhere, right? You want, you need a guy that's doing full-time or not full-time, but at least on it, you want to, you want to engage with the people that are looking at what you're doing. And, and that's the way you become successful. Um, the wine club that we're working with has over a hundred thousand Instagram followers. Mm -hmm. Um, and I look at the way they digitally market and, and it's, it's, they're dead on with how they do it. Um, you look at, you know, this is a comparison I give, um, you know, with, uh, you know, and I, it's not to knock anyone or anything here, but it's, 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 it's old school versus new school, traditional way of marketing and, and, and wineries and the way they brand themselves. Um, I, I'm assuming you're familiar with Height Cellar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Height Cellar is one of the most incredible wineries in the Napa Valley. Um, you know, I have I've been fortunate. My neighbor gave me a 1970 um, Martha's Vineyard cab mm. that you know, it, you know I've had I've had a couple of those, um, and it's one of my favorite wines. But again, you think about the price on what that would be. It's like I got lucky because he gave it to me. He has a credit for so. But back to what I was getting at is, go look at Height Cellars. Um, you know you would think that they've got this big, incredible market, right? Uh, and they do of, of, of selling wine, but go look at their digital, go look at what their Instagram followers are and then compare them to a, a winery like Scribe. Mm -hmm. Scribe was bought in 2007. And, you know, I believe, I can't remember what Scribe's following was, but I believe it's 50,000 plus. And I think uh, Heights, when I looked at it last, was something like three or 4,000. Yeah, Heights, may, you may have pinpointed the most old school winery. <laughs> on the trail there. there you go. <laughs> I, I'm always sure. To, I always stop there. I love their wines. The, the incredible wines. But that's what I'm saying is the difference between, you know, what people are doing now and what people were doing back then. Mm -hmm. You know, wine, the industry started off as a handshake deal. And that's, you know, and it's, it's like when I grew up there, it was farming country. Mm -hmm. Right. We, the shift is starting to happen. My demographic, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Gen X, you know, it, it's, it's starting, we're the predominant buyer right now of wine. Mm -hmm. And we've got some of the old school and some of the new school, but um, as it shifts and the next generation, the millennials come into play and they're, they're the primary, you know, wine connoisseur and purchaser, they're, they live on phones. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the, they live on the web, but in specific, they live on phones. And, and, and right now, the wine industry I'm seeing is focusing on their web experience. And, and, and hopefully, if you have a company you're consulting with and you're redeveloping your website, you're picking a mobile, what I call a mobile web responsive website to be able to make your website be, be able to purchase on that. Like I, we consulted right at the start of, the, of, of, the, of, of SIP with a, a winery, uh, a, a wine, dis well, a wine reseller, essentially a merchant. And um, their website was literally uh, a non-responsive site. So their, their biggest thing was you go on with your phone and it was like a really dinky dinky. Oh yeah. You know, it was essentially the web view on a phone where you couldn't really order on it because it wasn't a mobile responsive website. Mm -hmm. And so back to the millennials, that is, you know, millennials, then, then the next the Gen Z that's coming up after that, um, and my son, that's 10, right? Um, it, it's just 
uh, you know, I, I, I was joking with them, like, what's going to happen when I'm old and you're my age? And are you going to have like, like, you know, the, the, I forgot what minority report, I think on Tom Cruise, where he's just, you know, he's doing in the air type of yeah. stuff, but you know, computers and stuff like that. I said, are, are you going to be, you know, am I going to be hopping in a car that's hovering, you know, by the time, you know, I'm going to be scared because, oh, I don't know if I want to get on this. I don't know what it's doing. Right. Um, but, you know, this for me, what, you know, again, well, back to what Paul said on the on the industry, it is that's the, just the golden age. And I think you're going to see um, you're going to see wineries that are um, are going to go thrive and get, you know, incredible results. And you're going to have some of that struggle. I uh, another guy I talked with, he was talking with a winery and the, the owner is 70 plus years old. And he was like, I don't have time to learn any of this new stuff. And he said, so I'm going to hire you mm. to do it for me because I know it's needed. Right. And so I hate to say this. Uh, I really hope that like Napa Valley will come back into its realm of being the second biggest destination point for tourism at to next to Disneyland. But um, what's also has happened with the pandemic is people that don't live near the Napa Valley have now started uh, exploring wineries in their areas, mm. right? So you start looking at El Dorado region, right? Up in Sacramento, you look at even here in the Silicon Valley, people are looking at Santa Cruz and Cupertino, right? You're looking at, um, you know, people that were up in Oregon. Now they're, they're looking more in the, um, they're, they're looking down on the, on the, in the central coast, Paso Robles, you know, um, Santa Barbara, all these regions make some incredible wine. One of my favorite regions that I don't think a lot of people know about, which is one of our partners is Balboa Winery up in Walla Walla. Mm. Man, Walla Walla reminds me of me growing up in Napa Valley. I love Walla Walla. We, we yeah, just took it, a trip up there two years ago. It, it's, it's incredible. And, 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 you know, every year I go up, I have the opportunity to go up there. It, it, it's, you know, when I first went up there in 2000, I think it was 2012 was the first time I went up to that region. Um, it was still very farm and, you know, a few things. But when I went up, uh, you know, like 2019, I'm like, oh, my gosh, like the food, you know, the, 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 you know, the restaurants that are up and coming up there, the wines, like they're reds. I mean, some of them for me were actually blown away. Some of the reds that I got from Napa. Oh, yeah. Right? We're members of the Reiniger Wine Club and I, I love their wines. And, and, and that's the thing. So the pandemic has literally started putting people into those. And so the wineries we're talking with that are interested in bottle van, you know, we had a, we had, we have a winery that contacted us from, so I saw it's a, uh, I, I, I saw, um, and I'll mention it to them that, because they're, they're innovative, but it was a company called, it said Whistler Wines. I'm like, okay, Vancouver, because there's a big movement up in Canada, right? Mm -hmm. But no, they were Barossa Valley, Australia. Ooh. And, and they're interested in our QR technology. They want to generate QR codes using our system. So I have a follow-up uh, call with them. Um, here in the in the next week, so they're interesting enough. They're moving to Commerce Seven, right? And so it's kind of like like we're going through a Commerce Seven upgrade, but we <laughs> want to talk with you after that, right? Oh, fantastic. and so um, you know, again, wineries should be looking at that. They should be looking at you can't have that one individual that's doing it part time, and you're putting one post up once a month, or you know, once every three or four months. Um, you know. You know, preaching to the choir, you know, me and so, so I'm putting posts up with bottle in probably once a month, one or twice a month. Um, a lot of that is due to the pandemic. And we've been kind of like, you know, kind of mainstreaming, you know, where we're at and trying to keep everything, you know, just maintained. But one of the things that we've I've recently done, I've engaged with a friend of mine that's actually going to be kind of our growth manager. Hmm. Right. And she's already talking about it. She's like, OK, Paul, let's people don't know what NFC is. Let's make a YouTube video on NFC. Let's, um, you know, let's uh, let's educate people on how your problem can help the wineries. Right. Because um, I will admit um, I folk, I've been focused so much with helping wineries and people in the industry and kind of showing them how we use our platform that our website and the content we have doesn't really grab you of what we are as a, a as a technology. Well, that's and what so we find in marketing companies. You and I, our companies are all the same. We, we, it's the cobbler shoes situation where we spend so much time trying to help our clients tell their story and get their message out that we never really concentrate on our own. A hundred percent correct. And so, you know, I am definitely walking, working with a friend of ours that's, you know, doing growth management. So it'll, uh, 
you know, it'll be interesting how, you know, she gets everything put together for us. I mean, she's got the innovation, the chops, she's understanding everything. And she's brought out stuff that I was like, yeah, I know that's what we should be doing, but I haven't had the time because I'm helping another winery. So Awesome. So Paul, as we're sort of wrapping down here, um, where can people learn more about Bottle Van and you? Uh, so we, you know, feel free to send us uh, the, the leads that we've got is on our website. There's, there's, there's email forums and email phone number as well. You can leave messages. Um, the, uh, and that's bottlevan.com. Bottlevan.com. You can also send email to info at bottlevan.com if you want to go directly to it. Um, and we, we have our form there. You, um, we have a YouTube channel that's really small, but I've, I've been putting some videos up there. I'm hoping to start putting a few more things, but it talks there's videos of intros and pieces on that. I will tell you that, you know, can I do a little sales plug here a little bit? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So we're getting ready to do um, a, a nice plan. So if you, an entry level plan for any winery that, that um, you know, or distillery that wants to be part of the bottle and plan, um, we're doing a, a, a $50 a month, you know, no, no commitment, um, self-service, meaning you get access to our web portal and you can, we will onboard the winery products for you, but then you can start managing all the content and all the text and all that stuff behind the winery or a full concierge service for $99 a month. And it's an intro offer that we're just starting. Part of what happened to us in the pandemic, 2020 was our year to focus on sales and marketing. And with the pandemic, with everyone just trying to figure it out, we kind of shelved all that. And so what we did in the, during the pandemic was how can we come up with innovative ways to help our wineries, you know, help them engage with their customers? You can see uh, some really cool, you know, we did some cool virtual uh, tastings with Steve Reynolds. Mm -hmm. uh, we did one with Husick Vineyards as well. Um, we, you know, we, we, we did a bunch of webinars. We did a, a webinar with Commerce 7, Outshinery, um, Palette Exposure, another podcast. You know, we, we, we did that. So we did a bunch of things that we were trying to see how we could help with engaging remotely. Mm -hmm. um, the beauty about every one of those videos that we did, oh, we did a, we did a tequila series too um, <laughs> uh, with, with Steve and a bunch of people in the tequila industry. Um, but what's awesome about those videos was I produced all of those remotely. No one had to come on site. Um, Great. A little bit of a different with 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 the Husic one, the winemaker and Scotty, the 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 you know the sommelier and, and and the guy that was kind of you know working with Husic, um, they actually went outside and had, were socially distanced six feet apart, and so mm -hmm. there's so I was I produced it remotely. I wasn't on site, but you know they were at that piece. But all the rest of the videos are all literally like what we're doing right now. And, and again, it's, it's a testament to, you know, the way things have changed and, and how we interact and we do meetings, but um, they were all produced remotely. And so, um, again, you know, it's, it's uh, bottle of it itself is, you know, we're, 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 what I, what I got to on was like, we, our sales and marketing was supposed to be 2020. We're focusing that here in 2021. And part of that focus is um, literally doing uh, the, the promotion. Oh, there's also, yeah, how, do, how do they find out about that promotion? Um, they can, again, email us, they can, mm -hmm. you know, they can contact our phone number. Um, we're also partnering up with, a, 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 a photography company that's also doing some bottle shots where they're giving us that high discounts on bottle shots. If you're using the bottle in platform. So we're starting to look at cross, um, cross partnerships on, 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 on platforms and, and services. Um, but that one, you know, it's, it's a no brainer and, and, mm -hmm. and we, we are at this point just wanting to let you try it out. You know, it is what it is. And again, it's a month to month, right? If, if you're not seeing it's going to work, then feel free to leave. Um, uh, and, and you're not going to get, I, it's going to be pretty hard to find a platform that does everything we do for 50 bucks a month. Um, That's amazing. Uh, and so, but, you know, on that, on that note, we also have a couple more tiers on that. So if you want a fully branded one, we have a, what we call a, a white label where we'll skin it to your winery's colors. And then we have another tier on that, which we're working with the, the proposals I was telling you about. Um, we have uh, two large wineries that we're working with that to make a fully custom app. What, what um, Bottlevin's platform has done for us is been able to um, create a database and an API, like I was talking about, that can essentially build any software. And since we're software developers, we can build any mobile app, any web app, and so, and, and power it towards uh, the spirit and wine industry. 
um, again, it, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, we were able to, to provide at, you know, half the cost usually of what you would take for someone else to do a mobile app. So. That's amazing. So it's, it's been great talking to you, Paul. Um, fast, fascinating product you've got, fascinating tech and super great timing going forward into the pandemic. As we emerge from the pandemic, educating, helping wineries tell their stories. And if you want to learn more, check out info at bottlevan.com. Thank, thank you so much, Paul, for being on the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Legends Behind the Craft podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes. Thank you.